Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this, our first of four in a series of uh, webinars on managed care, managed cost. We call it MC squared. And um, half an hour today, part two will be on Thursday. Um, next week, Tuesday and Thursday, half an hour each will be the four sessions. I invite you to attend all four if you can. I'd like to um, begin by just a little housekeeping. During the presentation, if you have a question, because it's a webinar, you obviously can't raise your hand, or if you do, I won't be able to see you. So um, on your screen, the, on, to the right-hand side, there's a little panel that opens up with GoToWebinar, and you can type a question. There's a little box at the bottom. You can type a question. At any point during the presentation, if you want to ask a question, type it in. We'll get it here, and I'll, time permitting, I will uh, read the questions and answer them to the best of my ability. If we run out of time, then we'll send you an email uh, to every, all the participants and tell you what the question and answer was. So we don't want to, um, we want to respect the time. So we're going to hopefully be done at the stroke of 1230. So we'll get started. I want to begin by um, asking you all to participate in a little question. I'm going to, we're going to have a poll. So what should appear on your screen momentarily is a question, and you can all answer it, please. Um, you've got a choice. What do you think is the purpose of managed care? Do you think it's to reduce costs? Do you think it's to improve health care quality? Do you think it's to reduce staff? Do you think it's to eliminate services or to provide better health care record keeping? What do you, in your opinion, why was managed care invented? Okay, so give you another five seconds to click your answers, and then we will see um, the results of the poll. Okay, so let's see what you all think. Okay, so about 60% say the purpose is to reduce costs. And the other 40% say the purpose is to improve health care. Okay, so let's talk about managed care and uh, what it is. Managed care was invented in the proper health care world, um, the world about... Um, insurance and healthcare world and it was created basically by insurance companies to reduce costs. So the purpose of managed care is to lower the cost of healthcare. The insurers at the time fully believed that if I reduce costs, the way I will reduce costs is eliminate waste and duplication. And if I eliminate waste and duplication, what I should get is better health care. But that's not the point. If I get better health care, then bonus. But the purpose was to reduce costs. And I believe in New York State's OPWDD, in their rate rationalization and their march towards managed care, their purpose is to reduce costs. They fully hope and expect that the result will be a better quality of care because we've eliminated waste. But that's not the reason. We don't have managed care to provide better health care. We have managed care to reduce costs. Now, that's a completely different way of thinking, perhaps, to what you're used to in um, OPWDD today. Historically, you've spent the money you've needed to spend to provide proper health care to your people that you serve, and then you've filled out a CFR, you've submitted it to the state, the state has granted you a rate, and if there's a reason for you to get more money, you've had rate appeals, 
etc. So you've spent what you've needed to spend to provide what you need to provide and you've been reimbursed. Now we're talking about a march towards managed care, currently called rate rationalization, which is to reduce costs. So your focus needs to be on costs. This is a big new way of thinking. Think about when Columbus first set sail, sailed west to go east, and all the people thought he was crazy because he was going to fall off the end of the earth and be eaten by dragons. Well, once they've proven, after Magellan sailed around the world, and we proved the earth was round, everybody knew it to be a fact, it took 100 years or more for people to actually start thinking the world really is round and not flat takes a long time to change. This is what we call a paradigm shift. So I think what's the, probably the most important thing that we want to get across in our message is that this is a completely new way of thinking for you as you manage your agencies. It's not how do I best present in an optimal light to the state what I have spent and get my money back. It's you will get this much money, manage it, do a decent job, don't overspend because you're not going to get any more. So the focus needs to be on cost. Our uh, MC squared, Dopkins and Company, came up with this idea, managed care, managed cost. There's two MCs, that's the MC squared. And we have what we believe are four major topics that you should think about in this framework when you're thinking about managed care. And we believe that they go in order from left to right. So the first and most important thing is identify and manage the costs because the point of managed care is to reduce the costs. So the first thing you got to do is get a handle on the costs. Once you get a handle on your costs and you've you're trying, you're working at reducing them, you need to ensure to the best of your ability that you're providing a decent quality care and output. Managed care was designed to reduce the cost and if I do it effectively, I should get decent health care or better health care. So once I reduce the cost, number two is how do I optimize my performance? How do I ensure that I'm not um, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. In order to accomplish this, monitoring costs that I haven't historically had to monitor and optimizing my performance, I may need to make organizational changes. I may need to hire different people. I may need to move people into different jobs. I may need to train people to do different things in order to accomplish something that for low these 20 or 30 years we've not had to do. It's a big change. And as with anything that's a major change, the concern is it won't be consistently carried out. That's where compliance and internal control comes into play. How do I ensure that the people who are charged with monitoring costs, optimizing performance in their new organizational roles are doing it and doing it effectively? That's compliance and internal control. So these are the four topics that we're going to talk about over the next four sessions. Today is identify and manage costs. Okay? First thing is identify them. How are you going to reduce costs if you don't know what they are? Simple thought. Um, what we're talking about, <coughs> excuse me, are real actual costs. Not what I think I'm going to pay, not what I hoped I would pay, what did you actually spend? Because the point is to spend less. So spending less than I thought I was going to spend doesn't answer the question. Spending, actually spending less is the point. So you need to know your true costs. And we think you need to know it in as much detail as possible. How are you going to take a $5 billion chunk, this is the federal government example, take $5 billion and say I'm going to reduce it by half a million. Well, that doesn't, even, that doesn't even appear on the graph. That's such a small number. So you need to chop it up into smaller chunks and say, 
if I'm going to spend $340 for a toilet seat, I better get a good one. So I'm going to take it down to more detail. Okay? In the world of OPWDD, under rate rationalization, the state has identified some cost categories. And I've got a few of them listed here. They call them clinical costs. And there's a definition for clinical costs. They have clinical contracted. And there's a definition for what that is. What falls under program support? What is facility? And the state has provided a map, uh, a crosswalk, that says if it used to be on this line of the CFR, it's now called facility. And that's a starting point for how do I get to identifying the costs. And under rate rationalization, the state has also said, this is how, in the coming three to four years, we're going to pay you for each of these kinds of costs. So for example, facility might be a fixed payment per month. Clinical is a rate per hour. Um, program support, etc. So they're going to tell you, the state has already told you, this is what you're going to get for this. So in our opinion, that's a good starting point for identifying your costs. The state says, we're now going to reduce facility payments by 20%, and you don't know what goes into facility, how are you going to be able to react and lower your costs to correspond to the fact that they've lowered your payment? So um, step one is to identify what you're talking about, know what it is, understand it intimately in as much detail as you can, and then you're going to be able to react, because that's the only thing you can do is react when the state announces a 10% cut or whatever it happens to be. Okay? So step one, identify what those costs are. The next thing will be to try and manage them. Okay, what does that mean? Um, I think you want to plan for what do I expect and plan for what do I not expect. Um, a timely example is seven feet of snow that falls. And towns and counties all across western New York said, well, we just spent our entire budget for the whole year because we didn't expect that. Okay. Well, should they have budgeted for seven feet of snow? Probably not. But you have to have some plan when you're budgeting for so snow removal. What happens if we get a big storm in November? What are we going to do? because we're not going to get any more money, right? Is the county going to turn to us, the taxpayers, and say, before Christmas, we're going to raise property taxes because we've got to pay for the plows? I mean, you could try. Probably not going to happen. Their, fixed, their revenue is going to be fixed. They have to manage that cost. You should think about, in our opinion, different ways to look at those costs. It could be by program. It could be by department. You could say, what's the cost of heating this building? What's the cost of providing care to this person? So it's not just at an agency level. You want to do it in as much detail and look at it from as many angles as possible to be able to react to what's going on. And then you need to monitor the differences. Okay, I didn't plan for seven feet of snow in November. Maybe I plan for three feet of snow in December and we'll get none, hopefully, and then by January I'll be whole. Maybe that's going to work. We'll have to monitor and, and keep a, a tab on that. And as you see something that has changed and needs change, react to those issues. So that's how you manage those costs. I would venture to say that for a lot of agencies out there, you're not doing any of this because it's not been relevant in the past. You could spend what you felt was needed, and as long as you could justify what you spent, you'd get reimbursed. Not going to happen now. You need to look at the cost, and you need to make choices. What can I do to reduce that cost? Next thing that's going to be new and different about this is to find the true cost. Um, currently, a lot of agencies will do buy something, charge it to the agency, and then allocate it after the fact. 
and then a department or a program will see a cost number, but that cost number may not truly be what it costs that program. It's just what they got allocated. And so you may have gotten pushback from program directors in the past that say, well, that's, I can't manage that. I don't know what that number is. You just charged it to me. Well, if we're asking those program directors to manage and reduce their costs, we can't charge them with something that we can't justify. They need to understand it. So we need to know the true cost. That means wherever possible, you'll want to direct charge accounts payable expenses and payroll expenses to whoever used it, department, building, program, person. If you are going to do an allocation, it's a case where you and I share lunch. We're going to go to lunch Dutch treat. And how are we going to do that? We're going to split the bill either 50-50, which is agreeable, and we're sharing it, or you're going to pay for what you bought and I'm going to pay for what I bought, or I'll pay for the drinks and the tip and you pay for the meal. Whatever we agree to, that's a proper sharing, and we both know that that's the true cost. It is what we agreed to pay for. So you need to develop an equitable sharing methodology to do it. The best way will be to relate this cost to the revenue that it is about. When the state says, I'm going to reduce the payment for facilities, that's the revenue, and I'll want to know what cost goes into revenue facilities so that I can reduce that. Okay? How do we go about doing this? Budgeting. Okay? I think um, we're all used to at least the theory of budgeting. I'm going to have another poll. I'm going to ask your input. If you're still paying attention, hopefully, there's a poll here. This one is slightly different. You can check as many boxes as you think apply. So the question is, in your agency, how do you go about budgeting? Do you do an annual agency-wide financial budget? Do you do departmental and program budgets, so um, Main Street Dayhab has its own budget. Um, do you prepare financial or units budgets for each consumer, namely Johnny Jones, we're going to spend um, $10,000 on him this month. Do you re-forecast the budgets during the year? In other words, if you prepare the annual budget in November for the coming fiscal year, do you in May do it again and say what has changed? Or do you not prepare budgets at all? This is an anonymous um, poll, so feel free to answer honestly and check all that apply, hopefully, and we'll see what your, um, what your responses are, okay? Give you a couple more seconds to check the boxes, and then we'll see how you how our answers come in. Okay. No one, no one will admit to not pre preparing budgets. 89% have said we do an annual budget agency-wide. 100% do departmental budgets. So interestingly, the budgets happen at the department level. 22% do budgets on a consumer-by-consumer -consumer basis. And 28% say budgets are reforecasted during the year as changes come about. Okay? 80% of you voted. So the other 20% have already left. I don't know if that's true or not. But Okay? So let's give an example of budgeting. I think I venture to say one of the reasons people aren't doing as much budgeting as we would like you to do is that it's not, um, you think it's difficult or hard to do. And it may well be true, but let's talk about a household metaphor. Um, my daughter is graduating from college this month, December, and she's got a job, and she'll be, she has an apartment, so she'll be moving. Next, this coming weekend, we have to rent a truck and move stuff down to Columbus, Ohio. So she's now faced with budgeting her income. She's got an entry-level job and a salary um, and no health care. Um, so what has she got to plan for? She has to plan for rent, car payment, paying back her student loans, paying for utilities, insurance, car insurance, 
health insurance, um, life insurance, maybe. Um, renter's insurance, the apartment she has requires renter's insurance. Um, she's got a plan for food, and she's got a plan for entertainment, unless she's never going to have any entertainment. So she's got, and that's maybe just a short list of what she needs to think about. And she's only got X amount of dollars to spend because that's what her job is paying her. So if she wants to buy a new car and she wants to buy a Range Rover, then she could go to her boss and say, I need an extra $100,000 a year to pay for my new car. And the answer is going to be no. Simple answer. So she's got to work within the budget. And I think we've all probably been there and, and how that works. There's two basic types of budgets, and I think you should do both of them. Um, one is a baseline budget in which you take a baseline and start from there. So in this example, you, and many of you may do this, is you take last year's actuals. So you start in October. You take 10 months of actuals. You divide by 10 and multiply by 12 and say that's annualized. And I expect it's going to go up about 4%. You multiply it times 0 0.04, and then you call it the budget, and then you go in line by line and change things here and there. That's a baseline budget. And that's a good starting point. That's the easiest way to do it, frankly, is to go in and I've got to start somewhere, and it's a good, a good starting point. Um, the problem is it's a lot harder to justify reducing a cost because, in fact, I had to pay it last year. I probably have to pay it this year. There's not really uh, an incentive or uh, a motivation to say, just because I paid 10000 last year, why should I pay 10005 this year? Maybe I should pay 6000 this year. So basing it on history is a starting point, but it's not a good way to reduce costs. So compare that budget to what we call a zero-based budget, in which you start with nothing and you plan everything. So another timely example is your Christmas list. Do you sit down and say, what did I spend on my kids last year, and I'm going to spend the same thing plus 4%? Is that how anybody does a Christmas budget? Or do you say, give me your Christmas list. What do you want? I will go out and price it and figure out what I can afford to pay. And if I don't have enough money, I'm going to start crossing things off the list. So tell me which things you want the most, because I will try to get those first and then cross the other things off the list. Okay? So in this case, each expenditure needs to be justified. So I think you do both of those kinds of budgets. Um, this is the one that you can look at and start crossing things off the list. Okay? When you're preparing your budgets, don't forget to think about the units. Okay, by that I'm saying, um, look at your gas bill. If you get your gas bill that comes for your home, you'll see, at least on mine, which comes from National Fuel, there's a little graph that shows how many cubic feet of gas I've used every month for the last year. And if my gas bill is high, or what I think is high, and I look and see that the bar for this month is actually shorter than the other months, that means, okay, I'm using less gas, but it's costing me more. Okay, that's a looking at the units example. So just saying, well, the cost of gas has gone up, or I'm using more, I'll use less, that doesn't necessarily cut it. So you have to say, perhaps I'm willing to turn the thermostat down, and that will lower the cost of gas. But it, you can only turn it so low if the cost per unit is going up because eventually your pipes will freeze and I'm still paying more for gas. Okay? But you need to at least look at that and see, is reducing the thermostat a viable alternative? So looking at the units. You need to look at the details. Um, a lot of our agencies, when we look at their accounting, we'll see an account in the general ledger called transportation. Well, what's in that account? Well, um, the cost of vehicles that we own, the cost of vehicles that we rent, the insurance that we pay on those vehicles, 
the gasoline, oil, and maintenance that we put into them, the maintenance, the insurance, all lumped into one. In some cases, we even see the cost of an NFTA bus pass charge, because it's, in fact, transportation. But what it is, is it's a giant box of mismatched junk. So now when I say my cost of transportation is a million dollars, I need to reduce it 10%. Well, how am I going to get a 10% cut when inflation is going up by 3%? If we looked at it and said, well, we are tr transporting the people we serve by taxi, one way we could reduce the cost is get them a bus pass. But if you can't see that, if it's all in the lump, you're not going to be able to tell. Another example is fringe benefits. Do I just allocate fringe benefits randomly over a department, or do I actually charge what my employees actually get for fringe benefits? Another thing to think about in your budgeting is target which costs you're going to try and manage. You may not be able to manage every cost, and you may not need to manage every cost. If the cost is already pretty small, managing it to the nth degree isn't going to save me a lot. So you need to target the cost where there's pressure to reduce, namely where the state says, I'm reducing this category by 20%. There's pressure. Secondly, target costs that you can actually make a difference. Not every cost allows you to make a change. Okay? You can't really affect the cost of gasoline. The price per gallon is what it is. You can manage perhaps the units. Okay? Once you've got all these things going, these budgets by people, by unit, by department, um, baseline budgets, zero base budgets, reforecasting them multiple times a year, you've got all this data now to compare and identify, whoops, something went wrong. I can't afford to buy food this month. Maybe my entertainment was too high. Maybe I spent too much time at the bar last weekend. You can compare two different consumers. What does it cost per mile to get Johnny Jones to Dayhab? What does it cost per mile to get Sally Smith to Dayhab? So you can compare individual departments, individual um, consumers, which may be very different at the total level, but when you get it down to the units, they may be very comparable, and you should look at, for examples, to do that. Lastly, what you want to do is you want to monitor and compare soon enough to fix the problem. This is where the reforecasting stuff comes in. If a quarter, three months into the year, I notice that I'm woefully wrong in my budget for heating in facilities, it doesn't do any good to keep to leave it there and try to manage against it. I need to um, look at those and say, it's, in reality has changed, change the budget, and react accordingly, try to change differently. Okay? So that's our first bullet point um, on the MC squared, identify and manage your costs. There's so a whole lot of stuff there for you to think about. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff there that may be beyond your existing agency's skill set because, as I said, there's no shame in that. You haven't done it this way in the past. We're here, Dopkins and Company, to help you do this. We've got a lot of experience in cost accounting. We've got a lot of experience in budgeting. We've got a lot of things that we can help provide you um, to get to where we think you need, where you think you need to be in managing and monitoring your costs. On, um, on a Thursday, Ralph Jeswell will talk about the second box, which is optimizing performance. Once I've done what we, I've talked about today and identified all these costs, how do I react to the fallout if I try to reduce a particular cost? And that will be optimizing performance. The slides will be available um, if you want them. You can drop us an email, I think, and we'll send you the slides. Um, this webinar has also been recorded, so it will be available. So if there's someone in your agency who you hope would have seen it and wasn't able to, it will be, able, it will be available for them to watch again. Um, 
so I'm I think a minute and a half over budget, so I'm sorry. So that does, should not reflect on our budgeting ability and our consulting here. Um, there's a brief survey that's going to pop up at the end of this um, when we close the webinar. Um, at three simple questions, I'd ask you to rate them as you would normally do if you attend a, a seminar on how you think what you think you got out of this. Um, so thank you very much for attending. Hope to see you all on Thursday. And we're going to turn off the webinar now, and you'll get the survey. Please 